All right, you guys. If you're outside, come on back in. There's like a huge crowd of people outside. It's a really nice day. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, I wanted to thank everybody uh, last week for uh, greeting my Uncle Jim. I think he had a really good time being here. And maybe he'll come back. So that would be awesome. But I wanted to make sure everybody knew, if you weren't here last week, uh, he's written two books as well. And uh, his science book you can get on Amazon or on his website. But he has the other book that was more related to what he was talking about. And there's a couple copies still available here back on the back table that are free. So they're like a gift he gave to us. So if you want one of those, it has some cool resources in the end. Uh, Samuel and I were talking yesterday about how he has kind of a navigator approach to things. There's a lot of really good. He has like in the back, there's resources where he's like, these are 25 verses I think every Christian person should memorize. And then there's like 25 more. And these are good. Then they're good, you know. And so um, anyway, just know those are back there and they're available. Um, and again, thank you for greeting him because I think he had a really good time. And I did as well. So let me pray, and then we're going to get right into this. We're going to be going through Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 52. Um, you're kind of, and if this is your first time here, welcome. You're kind of coming in the middle, uh, or I don't know if it's the middle, the very beginning of our youth, or, or, or going through of it. You're coming in the very beginning of our study of the gospel of Luke. It's going to take us a while, but it's going to be really good. Um, so let me pray. Father, I pray that you would bless this time. As we, <clears throat> as we look at your word, that you would... Uh, Open our eyes to see what it is you want us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, we're going to be in chapter 2 of Luke, verses 21 through 52. If you have a Bible, you can turn to it. If not, we'll have it on the screen. Um, and it's going to be talking a little bit about the nature of time and how we relate to that. And the nature of time as a subject is something that's way above my pay grade. My uncle could maybe help a little bit with astrophysics type stuff. I don't get all that. So I don't know the full nature of time. I was watching that movie Arrival this week and, you know, that has a lot of time stuff in it. And I was like, yeah, I don't understand the nature of time. But I do know what it feels like to live in time because I do, <laughs> just like you. And so we're going to talk a lot about our experience with time. And if you look at if I had thought this through a little bit more, I'd have a picture. Like if you look, if you, art can help with this because... If you experience something like a painting, you know, some, you could sit there and look at a painting for a long time. And different, you know, people see, like, you'll hear about people going to art places that are into things like this. And they'll, they'll have benches in front of these paintings. And people might sit there for, like, a really long time and experience different things from this painting, you know. Because a painting isn't exactly, uh, it's a picture but it could also express more than just one moment versus like a song or a poem or even a book um, kind of lays time out in a different way where, you know, a song, if I just played you like one blip of a song and it was like, isn't that awesome? You'd be like, I don't even know what that, <laughs> you're like, yeah, that's the Beatles. You'd be like, I don't hear it. You know, you kind of have to hear the whole song to get the point. And then you're like, oh, okay, yeah. And so there's kind of a beginning, a middle, an end, but you're only able to experience it in that little slice. But if you hear just that little slice, it doesn't make any sense, you know. And uh, it made me think, I have this photo of myself uh, from when I was younger, which is like, have you all heard that Mitch Hedberg joke where he's like, every picture's of you when you were younger? You know, you're like, this is a picture of me when I'm younger. And he's like, every picture's of you when you were younger. He's like, he's like, if you show me a picture, this is a picture of me when I was older. I'd be like, what? Show me that camera, you know. Anyway, um, <laughs> pictures have a way of capturing a moment and saving it, you know. But you can interact with it differently. You know, I, this is a picture. This was me. Like, that was me all these years ago. I don't know how, when this was taken. But I used to be like that. And now I'm like this, you know. Um, and, but that still remains as a memory of sorts. And so when we interact with time, you and me, everyone, we can kind of only experience it as it happens. But like art, you can kind of cheat because you can remember things. Like maybe I remember that bike, you know, like I remember that. So it allows me to kind of cheat and go back in time in a way. Or I can kind of imagine things, you know, in the, and you can kind of interact with time like that. And like I said, art helps you kind of jump that gap that the perceptibility thing but we're familiar with past, present, and future, even though we're always in the present, you know, the beginning, the middle, the end of a book, you know, but you're always wherever you're reading, you know, whatever word you're on, that's where you're at. And so um, this message today is going to be a little bit like that. It's that theme 
in Jesus' life, but we're going to interact with it, I think, in the same sort of way, because you're going to notice that themes kind of appear as we go through it, and then we'll go to the next part, and they'll appear again, but they'll kind of include those, and then they'll appear again. It's almost going to be like a fractal, you know, like a math fractal, where it's like that same shape over and over again, and then it makes that same shape again, and I don't understand how that works either, but it's going to feel like that. Because what we have right now in this part of Luke 2 are the stories between Jesus' birth and his, like, adult ministry. And really, they're kind of, they're kind of it. You know, if you read the Apocrypha, there's other stuff in there. I don't know a whole lot about all that. You know, it's, it's like, there's legends about Jesus, you know, him making birds out of clay or something like that. But the, uh, none of those are in the Bible that we're reading, or our Bible, I guess, as Protestant people. But these stories are. And there's stories when Jesus was, you know, young, but not where he was headed, but he's not where he came from. It's like in-between stuff. So I call them the in-betweens. That's what we're going to be looking at. And uh, I'm going to hand you a bunch of stuff, the fractals, and then you're going to take it and, you know, hopefully it'll bless your life. It's blessed me get going through this stuff, so I hope that it edifies everyone else. Let me read this. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us, or for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, or establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time, from that time, on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And y'all remember we went through Daniel, and the, and the king had a vision of a, uh, it was in Daniel 2. Do you remember the way it has a statue, and it's made of gold and all this different stuff, and it gets, like, worse as it goes down, and then a rock comes. And, like, he's like, I had a really terrible dream, and I need everybody to tell me what I dreamed and what it meant. And they're like, yeah, we don't, we can't do that. And Daniel's like, God can, and then he does. And this is Daniel's response. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue. He's telling him the dream he had, you remember, An enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its belly and thighs of bronze, and its legs of iron, and its feet part of partly. I'm not reading well. Its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. And it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay, and smashed them. And then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer, and the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The rock that wasn't cut out by human hands became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. Sounds a little bit like and the increase of his, the greatness of his government and peace will be no end. It keeps going, Daniel 2.44. In the time of those, thing, of those kings, he's talking about the, the clay feet, you know, kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is big deal stuff. These are the prophets of the Old Testament. And what we're looking at in the Gospel of Luke is Jesus accomplishing these things. But in time. So he's like, well, do you think all of that stuff is done? He's like, no. But it's happening. And it's happened. It's happening. And it will happen. Dalton, come on up here. I've asked Dalton to come. He reads much better. So as we go through this Luke, 22, or Luke 2, 21 through 52. I'm going to have him read the whole thing, then we'll make a couple notes about it. Stories of Jesus as a child in our Bible. Uh, on the eighth day... Uh, no, sorry, forgive me. We start at 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses... Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what had been said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is, caused to, is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Every year, Jesus' parents went up to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth, Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Amen. Thank you. So two main themes we're going to be talking about these stories. Beholding God and growth in childlikeness. So the first story, you see Jesus' family taking him as a baby, several days old, to the temple for dedication, circumcision, and there was a, a, um, an offering to give the doves and things, you know, the pigeons. Are, and um, this is living as a Jewish man in a Jewish world, following the Jewish laws of the, of the Old Testament. You know, he's not skipping this stuff. And it's important because uh, these are rituals that they're following, ones that God's prescribed. And I'm going to take a, a, a minute, because this is one of the books I have as a resource during this time as we're going through Luke, uh, trying to... Because I'm not a person who's, like, super into rituals, okay? Like, I don't know if you picked up that I'm kind of... I'm mostly informal. So when it gets formal, I kind of go, am I doing it right? You know, and um, I could be mistaken to go, do I really need this kind of stuff in my life, like these rituals or something like that? And I thought Eugene Peterson addressed this in this book, um, which is a little bit of a rabbit trail, but this might help you see how this book works. Um, the usefulness of a ritual is that it takes a human action that is understood as essential to our ordinary lives and removes it from our immediate say-so. 
protects it from our tinkering and revisions and editing, and sets it apart from our moods and dispositions. There is more going on than I'm aware of or can be responsible for. Reality is larger than me. A ritual puts me into the larger reality without requiring that I understand it or even feel it in the moment. The handshake and hello, for instance, put me in a friendly place of encounter without requiring me to invent a greeting <laughs> or comment a comment each time I, appropriate to the circumstances. Or even think about it. It saves a lot of time. But it also maintains an appropriate connection to reality. Rituals are a good signal to our unconscious that it's time to kick in, says Anne Lamott. But th there is another useful dimension to a ritual. It keeps us in touch with and preserves mystery. For reality is not only larger than me and my immediate circumstances, it is also beyond my understanding. Rituals preserve that mystery, protecting certain essential aspects of reality from being reduced to the dimensions of my interest or intelligence or awareness. A ritual protects common but essential elements of human life from reduction, degradation, exploitation. I cannot take charge of a ritual. I can only enter in or not. Neither can I engage in a ritual by myself. Others are involved. So a ritual, is, a ritual simply as ritual prevents me from retaining any illusions that I am self-sufficient. At the same time, it thrusts me into a life with others. And it keeps going, but I just wanted to, you know. So I, you see Jesus' family taking part in rituals here. Um, and while they're there, um, it introduces themes which come up in Luke a lot. So I'm just going to, just breezing through these, you see the temple as a place uh, where God's presence on earth. We know this throughout the whole Old Testament. And Jesus will start to refer to himself as this temple. And so to use this body and clay pot type imagery to describe people and us. And it's this idea of a thing that's to be filled with something, this Holy Spirit thing. And he's carrying it around with him. Um, and you see ritual around the presence of God often throughout the Bible. And so it's, it's kind of cool that this happens here because there's two witnesses that happen, well, like while well, Jesus' family, they're not going to meet with these guys. It's not like, hey, I heard there's an old lady and an old guy at the temple. We should go talk to them. They're there to do something else with like the priests and stuff, you know. And then they're like, these old people are there and they're like, wait a second, hold on a minute, you know. <laughs> and the first one is a guy, Simeon, and he's been waiting on the consolation of Israel. And there is, again, this consolation thing is this word paraclete, which is talking about the Holy Spirit. So he's like, I've been waiting on this Holy Spirit, and this is it, you know. And then he starts to prophesy over Jesus, Sovereign Lord, you've promised me, you know, you can now dismiss me. You've done what you promised. Because the Holy Spirit had told him that he was going to see this consolation before he died. And then he did. And we're going to come back to this in a minute. Um, but he sees this, and he prophesies these things over Jesus, which, which kind of, like I said, He's not leaving behind his Jewishness, but like a rock that's growing and filling the whole world, he's kind of taking that and growing it into something that now includes everyone who calls on his name. You see it even in here. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. The, the Gentiles, the people walking in darkness, they can see again, you know. And then, and the glory of your people Israel. He's not like, oh, that didn't work, so I'm going to do something different. That's not what's going on here. He's saying... I made a promise, and I'm going to keep it, and I'm keeping it through these people, and it's happening right now. And that promise is for everyone who will call upon Jesus' name. But it's coming through these people. So he's kind of saying they were right. Like the things they were saying were right. And it's that their rightness leads to this revelation for everyone. You know? And so it's, it's just really cool stuff he's just putting together in two little sentences. The child's father and mother, Moses, jo Joseph and Mary, marveled at this. And then Simeon says this, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Which that kind of ends on a pretty sobering moment where you're like, well, it's not going to all be fun and games, you know. But we'll move on. Really. Then they encounter Anna, who's an old woman, and she's a prophetess. So she's a, a woman who's a prophet who's in the temple, who her husband has passed away, and she's dedicated herself to praying for um, the restoration 
of Israel and these kinds of things. The redemption of Jerusalem, it says specifically. And she also celebrates um, Jesus being there. And this is just an amazing event to have this blessing from this, you know, a male, an older man and an older woman of this infant Christ. And it's coming from, like, again, like these other times, it's not because Mary and Joseph said, hey, you don't know who you got here. We need to talk to the manager because this is, like, an important person. You need to do something. You know, like, it wasn't like that. Like, they're going in to do the normal thing like normal people do. Like, God said back in here in Leviticus that we need to go, we need to do this circumcision thing and bring the doves. And they're like, so we're going to go talk to this guy. And they're like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And you're like, who are you? You know, and those are the people that are praying these very important blessings over Jesus' life. And then, the, and then they go back to Nazareth, which is where they lived. And when they had performed everything according to the law, again, they're not rejecting this, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. The child continued, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's kind of a thing. He's growing and increasing in strength, growing. And then, you, you, so then we jump to another story, which is when they visit to Jerusalem when Jesus is like 12 or something like that. And... Um, this is really, because like even this first story, there's like we said, these are tweens. This one, he's still like a baby. So like this is like a week within him being born or, you know, that kind of thing. This one is like years later. So it's like skipping years. Then you're here and then we'll skip years, you know, in the next couple chapters. So this is kind of the only story from Jesus' childhood that we really have. And again, his family is participating in a Jewish ritual, which is the Feast of Passover. So they go back to Jerusalem to do that. And, like, people did this, you know, so they go from Nazareth with a group, you know. And um, and, th- and just so you understand how this works, because you might be like, what is up with his parents to, like, not notice he was there? So how- the way it worked was, like, you would just walk <laughs> to places, you know, or, like, you know, remember the other story, that like, and we have, a, we have a donkey for today because you're pregnant. But, like, generally speaking, it's a big group of people walking. And, like, the kids play together, you know. And so... Um, there's safety in numbers and this kind of thing, and you would travel between these places, and, you know, there's a big crowd. And so you might not see your kid for a couple hours while he's playing with these kids as you travel. And then when you get to where you're going, you're like, all right, where, where are my people at, you know? And um, it worked. It worked pretty well. Like, they weren't helicopter parents like we are, you know? And they didn't know where it was all the time. And so Jesus' family does all the Passover stuff, and when they're headed back, they accidentally leave Jesus there because they assume he's with the group because there's a reasonable to assume that, you know? And then they realize he's not there, and they go back and find him, and he's in the temple, but he's talking to adult men who are like, my whole job is to study the Bible. And, like, these guys had, like, memorized the thing. You know what I mean? They were serious experts. And he's like a kid telling them stuff about what, and they're interested in what he has to say. They're not like, all right, you know, pipsqueak, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. They're like, why do you, how do you know this stuff, you know? And, um... Jesus' parents are worried, as they should be, you know, and his mom's like, why did you even, like, this is, why did you do this to us, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, he says back to her something which is beyond just an answer. He says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house, you know, which is starting to lean towards what he's here to do. But it says he obeyed them and went back and, you know, life goes on. But it ends again, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor in God and man. And that's all we need to see of him growing up. Now, he's, now, keep in mind this. Jesus is born. This is God in the flesh. And he's never not God. And he lives 30 years or so before he starts to do the ministry stuff that we're going to kind of be looking at. And then, it, like, really, we're gonna, there's a whole lot about, like, the last week of his life. So the, the way that the, the, the kind of, like I was saying again, the way we can interact with time on a page, if you count, like, the amount of, like, lines for per year, it doesn't line up right. Like, this is like 30 years gets like this one little chunk, and then like the last week gets pages. You see what I'm saying? And um, I think this is, because you could have just not had this part, but I think this is in here to give us a little window that can help us. And this is where we start to talk about some of this childlikeness. You need to think about Sometime. You don't have to do it literally right now. I'll help you. I'll give you some pieces. You take them home. This idea that God grows up. Does that sound weird? I feel like it should sound weird. Like, we're talking about God, the creator God, the uncreated one, the one that met Moses in a flaming bush, comes into human flesh to do things that were prophesied for, and he grows up. 
So like me, that photo of me, when you're like, that's young you. And I'm like, yeah, but now this is me, you know, and you may go, I like that one better. Like, well, that's too bad. But like, <laughs> like Ricky Bobby or whatever. The, uh, the point is, uh, you know, you, there's, a, there's things to ponder in this idea that God grows up. I'm gonna, I mean, we'll talk about a couple of these. And it's in there, Isaiah 9, 6. I read this. For unto us a child is born, and a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. If you just said a son is given, you could be like, I get it. So like at some point, we're all going to be hanging out, and then God's going to just walk in and be like, hey, I'm God. You know? And that does kind of start happening in the next couple chapters, like if it just started there. You know, some of the Gospels sort of do. It's like, I'm Jesus, the man coming here to do the, the God stuff, you know. But here we have the pre-story where he's like a kid or an infant or an unborn person doing stuff the whole time. And this verse says it, for unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. So he's not to always be a child. He is to grow, but he is to come as a child. He's not just to be born because the whole government, you know, it's like you wouldn't. Jesus has now stepped into time. This is eternity now stepping into our time, and you can't quite conceive it. And this, you're not supposed to, and it's fine. But it gives us a little window. And I want to talk about this. Um, these are my definitions a little bit, but I think you'll understand what I mean. Jesus, unto us a child is born, okay? And this is the whole Christmas deal, so we're about to be going through this again. Let's, I want to talk about the difference between childlikeness and childishness, okay? And again, like these are, this is, I made these definitions sort of, so <laughs> I just hope this is a helpful way to clear your mind of things. Because you'll see this. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, it says this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. So when you hear that, you're like, yeah, I don't want to do childish things because that's what kids do. And I want, I'm grown up, right? You know, I grew up, you know. And then you go back and Matthew, and Jesus says this in Matthew 18, 3. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you're like, well, do you want us to be like kids or not? And this is where I think my childlike versus childish is helpful. Uh, and maybe you would say something like this, that childish is self oriented, lack of understanding, and fully self-minded. Like, I'm only focused on myself, how I feel, and what I want, and da-da-da-da-da-da. And a kid, is, it's okay if a baby does that, because they're a baby, they don't know any better, right? Versus what we might say childlike, and the way I describe this is that you still have the eyes of wonder. Like, you haven't given up on life, okay? Hang out with me for a second. Because you see this shown and illustrated, and you might even remember this in your own life, the Bible uses the theme of nakedness to kind of talk about this relationship to shame. Because in, the, in Genesis, when God creates mankind, he says they're naked and unashamed. And then they sin, and immediately they're like, I need to clothe myself. And you can go like, it's, that means a lot more than just clothes and like nakedness, okay? There's like, this is, God made them the way they actually are, and then they did wrong things and learned how to hide that for the rest of humanity. And, and you can see in a baby, like I remember, I have younger brothers, and I remember like one time, like, I don't know if it was one time, but I, I have a memory of my youngest brother like getting out of the bathroom and just like running through the house, and he knew it was funny. He was totally naked or whatever. And like, no, if an, if an adult did, they'd be like, there's a problem with this person. But when it's a little kid, you're like, oh, that's really funny, you know, and all this kind of thing. And, um, but he wasn't ashamed. He was just, it, he knew it was funny, I guess. But uh, so you can even see this, that in a way, like my brother or whoever, like as a child is okay being themselves. They haven't learned yet that you can't do that. You see, a child is, um, a child isn't hiding who they really are. And Jesus came in that phase of a human life, even before that, but he, he lives through this. We're seeing, a, like, he's still in that, that age where he, has, he hasn't lost his eyes of wonder in this story that we're entering back into time. And this is telling us something that happened 2,000 years ago. So even this whole thing is back in time. But you have to think about this. 
at what point in that whole story, or the story that we're looking at, was Jesus ever not God? The answer is never. But he was like really small, and he got bigger. So is there more God now? Like, well, no, like you could have like my kids have some of the shirts I had when I was younger that stuck around for some reason. My kids like sleep in them now or something like that. And for some people, like, well, where'd you get that? And they're like, well, that was your shirt. We're like, why don't you wear it anymore? And I'm like, well, it's too small. And they're like, why? They're like, well, because I grew. You know, it's like it's so obvious. You don't even. This isn't even funny what I'm saying. But like, the. I think sometimes we can conceive of God because God is unchanging. But then when he steps into our time, he came in as an unborn child and then grew and then grew. And then, like, he would outgrow things. You know, Jesus outgrew clothes. And and what that, I think, represents is an accumulation of life and experiences that's the same as ours. He didn't shortcut and cheat. Okay? Like when Jesus had to learn to walk and he fell, it hurt the same way it hurts us. This is important stuff. Because all those experiences we have accumulate the good and the bad ones. And I assume Jesus' parents were good parents, you know? Some of us didn't have good parents. Some of us had, you know, and your whole life can lead you to like some sort of brick wall, is what I would like to call it. It's, it's this moment. Where even like you look at these stories and you're like, come on, man. Like, do you really expect me to believe this anymore? Like, you're telling me that that you actually think this happened? And we'll we'll sometimes try to reason our way through it. Well, well, people did things differently back then, or well, this did it. And what I'm just gonna tell you just for the sake of today is you can't reason your way all the way there. No matter how much evidence you could find, you know, and it's fine to do that stuff. We actually should do that, and we need to do that. But there's, you're always going to hit this brick wall. It's like the event horizon of a black hole. You're like, I can't see past this. And you're like, you can't. Where something else is required to enter this kingdom of God. Like we were just praying in Ephesians, like this revelation. God has to open this mind, because it, you can't make it make sense. Because if... You, you take this story as we're reading it, and as we're going to continue to read it, it's either true or it's not, and that's incredibly consequential, but it's very, very hard to believe, if you're honest. And God, I think, wants it that way. He's like, well, if you really take your time and go through it, you can see how this all makes perfect sense. It's like, it doesn't make perfect sense. Unless God is who he says he is, and unless this is all exactly how it happened. So it's like the story's either crazy or it's true. But this is where the childlikeness can come in. Uh, because a child doesn't struggle as much. It hasn't accumulated as many experiences to learn that, you know, because you have things that happen in your life. Well, I thought God was this way. It doesn't seem like he was this time, you know. And you've had these in your own life. Sometimes it's helpful to look at things on a bigger scale because it's not as personal. But you could look at something like the Holocaust and be like, God, if you're real, why did you let that happen? This is a real good question to ponder, you know. God, if you're real, why did this bad thing happen to me? Or God, if you're real, I've, we prayed for this and you didn't do it. So you're either really mean or you don't care, both of which I don't really like very much, right? This is how life stacks up on you like that. And you have to walk through this at some point. But what's, what, what's interesting is the, what Jesus tells everybody is like, unless you can become like this child, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven because you're going you're gonna to grow out of this child. You'll leave behind childlikeness. You know, if you grow healthy, you'll, you'll leave behind childishness. You know, but oftentimes the life will do to you is you'll leave behind childlikeness. And you'll be like, come on, let's be for real. Like, it's not that great, or blah, 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 this kind of stuff. And the solution is to find that childlikeness again. And that how helps you get over the brick wall. Um, I don't know if this is making sense, but let me help. I've read this before because I think when we start to see God's nature 
especially as Jesus is a, is a, is a child, um, he doesn't lose this. He doesn't leave it behind. But it might be the fact that that's because that's how God's nature is. And G.K. Chesterton, who's a very smart person, wrote a book, Orthodoxy, this about the nature of God, and I think it helps. Grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible. He says possible. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all the daisies alike. It might be that God makes every daisy separately, but he's never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. The repetition in nature may not be for mere recurrence. It may be a theatrical encore. I want to pray for us today that we can rediscover in ourselves that lost childlikeness that we once had because I think that's the key to understanding a relationship with God that will make the rest of this story make sense. He could have just skipped it all, and he left this in here. He's like, you need to remember what it's like to be there. And God can relate to this because Jesus literally did it. Like, if you're like, well, you don't know what happened, when, like, what it felt like to be a kid. He's like, actually, I do. I was one of those, you know. That's important. Because this story reads like a fairy tale. You know, it reads like the Lord of the Rings, and it reads like these other fairy tales where there's a really, there's evil things that happen, but don't worry, the good guy's coming, he's going to make everything right, and then in the end, all the, everything left is good, and good reigns and all this kind of stuff, and you're like, yeah, I know, but we grow up, and people don't live happily ever after. I know, I mean, it's, it's nice, it's fun, like, I like Star Wars too, but like, you know, it doesn't really work like that. And what this book is asking you to believe is, yes, it does. Like, this fairy tale is actually true. Frederick Buechner says it like this. It's a world, and he says this in this book, Telling the Truth, which you might want to get. It's a world of magic and mystery. Talking about fairy tales now. Things that's too good to be true. It's, it's a world of magic and mystery, of deep darkness and flickering starlight. It is a world where terrible things happen and wonderful things too. It is a world where goodness is pitted against evil and love against hate order against chaos, and a great struggle where often it is hard to be sure who belongs to which side because appearances are endlessly deceptive. Yet, for all its confusion and wildness, it is a world where the battle goes ultimately to the good who live happily ever after. And where the long run, where in the long run, everybody, good and evil alike, becomes to know, becomes known by his true name. That is the fairy tale of the gospel with, of course, one crucial difference from all other fairy tales, which is the claim, which is that the claim made for it is that it is true. That has not only happened once upon a time, but it's kept happening ever since and is happening still. So we don't need to hide the fact that what we're talking about here, in a sense, is a fairy tale, but it's the true fairy tale. It's the one that makes the other ones make sense. And you can actually read... uh, this is true of how C.S. Lewis came to know the Lord. It was through conversations that he realized, wait a minute, one of these stories is true, <laughs> and that's why we have them and all that kind of thing, but that's, that's where I would children and get into it. And could it be that there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain? Like, what if, what if that was actually true? What would that change? Like, how, how would you live? Like, what if it was actually true that there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain? We sing that, you know. It's just like the rock, the one rock, tears down all of these pretenses of mankind, the fakeness of it all. There's nothing left, and that rock is left, and the rock grows to filling the whole earth. And just like Jesus came as a baby and grew and became a man, he grew, the whole thing grew. His kingdom is growing, and it keeps on happening. The more people have this revelation of who Jesus is, like, what if it's true? It is true. It is true. And there's no other way. Like, the only thing you can do is, like like I read earlier about the ritual, is you can either take part in it or not. I can't, and no one can prove it to you. I can just tell you it's true. 
this story is true. It's true. And that means everything. But I can't prove it to you because God doesn't want it to be proven. He wants, like a child, you to relate to him, to know him. The solution is found in a relationship, not in a logic, not in a math proof, like my uncle was talking about last week. Like, I can prove it mathematically that God is real. It's like, these, there's room for this kind of talk, you know. But the point is, you'll never quite get there. You're always going to feel that brick wall right at the end. And that's because the solution is relational. It's loving. It's the kind of thing that a baby who's been, you know, out of the mom for seconds understands the love of a, a mother instantaneously. And you're like, well, that's biologically programmed. Or it's like, maybe, or there's things going on, you know. And um, you don't have to understand it to take part in it. But we lose it. We lose this childlikeness because we encounter bad things. And some of us even have really bad childhood. Like you go, I don't like thinking about childness, childlikeness because everything in my childlike phase of life is terrible. And I understand that. Or you have really bad things that happen. Or things you really put a lot of faith in God and it didn't work out that way. It's important to walk through that and to be honest about it. And it was like, well, I didn't really care. Yes, you did. And it's okay. We all have this. This is the way it works, you know. But God, because this is true, is the only one who can relate and redeem those things and bring healing to those broken places that are broken beyond human remedy, Okay. Like, it's not like if I just get my head straight, I'll, it'll be all right. It's like, it won't. You need something outside of yourself to do it. And so I'm going to close this, this concept of the eyes of wonder. That Wendell Berry had that quote that I shared where he says, a man who thinks he knows the truth no longer looks for it, which has, like, wide-ranging problems. You don't want to be that guy. It's not to say, like, to, to, to think, I, if you understand it, meaning the person who thinks they know everything, like I got it all figured out. You don't have it all figured out. None of us have it all figured out. I know the truth, if you mean it, like I know, I know Jesus, you know, so don't hear it, don't mishear it that way. What he's saying is you're resting on your own understanding, which Jesus no, he says don't do. Um, you don't look for the truth anymore. And when you're like that, you start to miss things like this. Verse 50, it said this, but they did not understand what they were saying to them what he was saying to them. Jesus' parents didn't understand what Jesus was saying to them. He's like, hey, didn't you know I was going to be in my dad's house and stuff? And like, we didn't, uh, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, kind of. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm following. You know, I'm, I'm following you. You know, like I said, we encounter time as it happens. Like, Jesus' parents have been scared they lost the guy. You know, think about the angels. It's like, you are going to have the son, son of God. And, blah, blah, blah. and you're like, okay, um... God, like, and as they're rushing back, praying, like, hey, I lost him. Can you help? You know what I mean? Like, some of you can relate, like, to Pastor Jeff's story about losing his child at, like, Disney World or whatever that was. You know, it's like you felt some of that. But, like, think about if it was, like, not only your own child, but, like, Jesus. You're like, oh, man. Like, we're in a lot of trouble, you know? <laughs> so there's a lot of complex emotions there. Um, and then when he answers, they're like, I don't understand what you're saying to me, you know? That's okay. It, like, because Simeon said earlier, he's like, he's even going to be a sword that will pierce your soul too. Meaning like hers, his, and everyone's. Often we are bothered because we don't fully understand. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I'm kind of like that. Like, I'm bothered when I don't understand things. And, and it's not that we don't understand things. Like, that's too black. Like, like, I understand or I don't. Like, Jesus' parents, they're like, they, they got what they were doing. Like, they knew who Jesus was, but they didn't understand what he was saying. And I think that's usually where we are. We're like, there's like, I don't understand at all, and I understand everything, which is not something we're going to get to. But we're maybe like, here. Like, I understand some, you know, but I don't understand, like, you know. And so when God doesn't do things the way I think they're going to be done, it's usually it's because it's over here somewhere. Okay? So it's like, I don't understand this. You know, and understanding isn't maybe even the main thing that we need to deal with in that kind of situation. Because when you're in the middle, you can't always see. Just like Jesus' parents couldn't, they didn't quite get what he was saying. 
You might think God is with you when he isn't. <laughs> I wrote this. You might be traveling in life with a group of other devout religious people, and all of you together haven't noticed you left God behind. You don't want to do that. But if you do, it's all right. Just go back and find him, all right? You know, like, that's what they did. They're like, okay, we left God behind. We should probably go get him, all right? So if you wake up one day and realize that's you, th there's a solution. Go find him, you know? But that's easy to do. In the day-to-day -day life, we can just accidentally all real. And it's, it's like, you think there's safety in numbers. We're all doing it together. Like, all of us together could be moving in some way, and we've left God behind, you know? And you don't realize it till you realize it, you know? And so, um, anyway. But... Really, it's this. If you're expecting an end from God, like the end, the government will rest upon his shoulders. Okay. He's going to sit on David's throne. Okay. This is big deal. This is adult stuff. Right? That's big time adult stuff. You know? If you're expecting an end from God, you can sometimes miss the beginning if it happens. This is important. You remember when they were starting to build the temple back, and he's like, don't despise the small beginnings, because you can despise the small beginnings, right? We mostly do. He's like, unless you willfully or consciously, faithfully don't, you will. Just about everything we do is small beginnings. Just about Jesus' whole life was small beginnings. If you're expecting an end from God, you can miss the beginning when it's happening. You might miss him when he's present. You might not notice him when he's active. And this is where Simeon falls back in the old guy. He's just going about his thing. And he knows that God told him, you're going to see the Messiah. <laughs> and he goes, I'm sure he took the time to look at all the stuff. I just read you a couple verses. Like, he knows all those. Dude's got it, you know. He's like, I, I don't know if he's even told everybody this. You know, you kind of have to, like, see how. He might have just had this thing with God where God's like, I'm going to, I'm going to show you this. He's like, whoa. And so he's like on his own time, like looked to himself. And he's like, it's going to be like, and he might imagine what's this going to be like? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to look like? And he might've started imagining stuff that you see, I don't know, later on in Luke, or I don't know, the book of Revelation. You know what I mean? Like, I know, I know what this is going to, I know where we're headed on this. They are the happy ever after part. I'm going to see that. I'm going to see it. I'm going to see it, and he's like, be like, dude, who do you think you are? He's like, I don't know. God told me. So, like, I, you know, I'm going to see that. You know, I'm going to encounter it. And then one day, a couple brings in a baby. Is that, is that all that stuff? You see what I'm saying? He was all that stuff. There's never a moment where Jesus wasn't all that stuff. And, like, later when he starts saying, like, the kingdom of God is among you, he's talking about himself. You know, he's like, I am that, you know, like I am the flaming bush God, the God that called himself. I am, I am that. Now I'm just in a human body. And like, I am all of that the whole time. And that will lead to all this really, really, really awesome stuff. And we can trust that it will because he's come through, you know, but like, you could be like Simeon looking for this. I'm looking for all this, you know, da, 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 you know, and then a baby comes in. What we know about this guy is he hadn't lost those eyes of wonder. Because he saw it. He's like, wait a minute. That's, this is what God promised. And I, could, it like, and I would think that, like, maybe he had a friend. I mean, like, we have friends, you know. It's like, I haven't told this to everybody, but, you know, I told my friend that God told me I'm going to see the Messiah. You know, like, maybe you will, too, if I'm, you know, we hang out together, you know. And they're, like, waiting. And then maybe he's just cleaning stuff, you know. Like, you know. And he's like, wait, there he is. And then you're like, the friend could be like, who God didn't tell us. You could be like, I'm not seeing it. You know, like, it's just a kid. I mean, like, whatever. They're doing the thing. You know, we bring the doves and stuff. Like, it's just a baby. He's like, yeah, but that's, that's the baby. You know, like, how do, how do you know? It is because he could see. You know, and we, this is the thing that God has to do. I, when we prayed in Ephesians about God giving us that revelation. You can't get there with logic. You can get there with faith. And God will meet us in there, and then there's a relationship that starts to form. And the relationship is like a relationship with anybody else where there's love, interaction, and conversation, and, and, and all that kind of thing. But you'll find, mentally speaking, that that relationship with God functions far more like childlike relationships than really twisty, tricky, adult-like relationships. What I mean by that is God's not 
dumb. God understands things. Like his mind's greater than ours, obviously. But God means what he says. And God takes us seriously. There's, a, there's enough warning in the back of this Bible that when like, people say, like, hey, God, I promise I'll do this, he's like, okay. And then like hundreds of years later, he says, you promised. And they're like, what, what, I forgot. And he's like, I didn't. You know what I mean? And so like, God acts very with us. We're so used to, as adults, hiding who we are, pretending we're somebody else, that when we encounter a pure and holy God, we don't even remember who we are anymore. So we don't have, we, so it, our struggle with relating to God often has a lot more to do with us even knowing who we are to relate with him other than, uh, you know, this kind of broken, like this gap of communication, you follow me? So that's kind of where it's at. I want to end this, this this way because there's two songs. One of them is in that, uh, the playlist we made for this, uh, this, Going through Luke, we made some resources. One of them was a playlist, and it's called Now Behold the Lamb by Kirk Franklin. It's one of my favorite songs. It's on that playlist because we need to behold him over and over again. But I'm going to play right now as a closing this song by Jason Upton. It's called When You Were a Child. And I think he wrote it, I think, like kind of reflecting, you know, as he was having kids, be like, you know, you start to see you start to remember what it was like, you start to remember, and then you start to see this connection here of this childlike relationship with God, and you start to see how, you know, anyway, how that cuts through the brick wall. And so I'm going to play this song because it's like an invitation. God's inviting us to become childlike so that we might enter his kingdom and live for him in these dark times. So I'm going to pray, and then I have to play this video. So, Father, I ask that you would heal our hearts in the broken places that we may feel comfortable to be ourselves again and to stand before you in truth and honesty and to relate to you um, in, in truth. And that we might have eyes of wonder and to not forget that your fairy tale is true. And I just pray that you would um, break through to us in the hardened parts of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.